Redeemer Christian Church, you can go ahead and have a seat. We are so glad you're here, whether you're in person or online. We are glad you joined us to worship our great God today. We hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving, but you know what that means. It means Christmas is right around the corner. And so we wanted to highlight a couple of things for you this morning uh, as we celebrate this season together. Of course, we're going to have our three Christmas Eve services, but this year we wanted to help you kind of uh, maybe start a conversation or engage your neighbors and coworkers. And so starting next Sunday and going through December 19th, out in the commons, we're going to have professionally made, individually wrapped cookies. And there's going to be six of them in a gift box for $5. And the idea here is that you buy that and you take it to your friends and your coworkers and you give it to them, telling them you appreciate them, but also using it as a conversation starter to hopefully invite them to one of our services. You can even tell them what service you're going to and that you're going to save them a seat and show them where, we, where you sit. It um, be a great way uh, to share the joy this Christmas. Another way, another opportunity we have is uh, we always uh, adopt families for Christmas. Uh, and this year is no different. We're going to be doing that again. There are a lot of families, obviously, in our community that are struggling, that may not be able to have a normal Christmas. And so this is a way we can step up, be the hands and feet of Jesus, and, and shower them with love and gifts. And so um, I wanted to let you know, we already have 70 families adopted, which is pretty awesome, uh, and matched. And then, uh, but I wanted to also let you know, there's at least 10 that have applied that we don't have a match for. So if that's you, please go online to greenwoodchristian.com and sign up. Uh, or if you know a family that needs assistance this year, uh, please direct them to our website. You just go to the, the website, go to the resources tab, and then you go to the registrations link and scroll down to the local outreach, um, and you'll see both opportunities, both links there, to adopt or to sign up to be adopted. So what a tremendous way that we can share Christ's love uh, with our friends and neighbors. Um, and now we're going to celebrate uh, as we watch Shauna Ingle uh, be baptized.
you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I stand here today to ask that you continue to bless us in a way that only you can do. That you take barley, loaves, and sardines and turn them into spiritual feasts, Lord. And as undeserving as we are, you continue to bless us with abundance, unconditional love, and forgiveness. Lord, it is through your grace that I pray that we, even as flawed sinners, will continue to live each day in the gratitude that you have provided us. I pray that through our strengths, Lord, that you can magnify those so that we can live in servitude of you and we can serve others. Lord God, I ask you today to continue to show us the way so that way we can show others that in pursuit of being more Christ-like, that we can show others the way to the Messiah, the Messiah that can take nothing and turn it into everything. Lord, it is in your name that I so humbly pray. Amen.
morning. My name is John. I'm the outreach minister here, and uh, we are continuing our study of key biblical principles using a book called Core 52. We've been using this book all year. If you haven't yet picked one up, there's still time to pick one up. Maybe not for 2021 necessarily, but perhaps you could use this as your, your 2022 uh, study um, as you grow closer to God and, and learn more about the principles laid out in Scripture. It really is a great study, and you can get this study for free by visiting the Connection Center and just asking for a Core 52 book. After this service, feel free to go there and, and get one and make that your 2022 study, but we're continuing to study through that book uh, and the principles laid out in that book. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, you can get one of those as well. Between the doors as you leave here today, on the left and on the right, you'll be able to see some Bibles. They are study Bibles that you can pick up and you can take with you. It's our gift to you. How many of us in this room like history? Any history buffs in here? Yeah, quite a few. The year was... 1860. 1860, two men decided to plant a church in Greenwood where a wider population was moving. They came from about five miles from the northeast from Rock Lane Christian Church. Some of us in this room have heard of that church, and these two men had a vision to plant a church in the upcoming town of Greenwood. Again, this was 1860. Greenwood didn't become a town until the year 1864. But these two men felt led to plant a church in this upcoming town, so they bought a one-room schoolhouse for the amount of of $200. Can you imagine that? $200. This one-room schoolhouse was located to what is now Isom Elementary School on Broadway and Meridian, and they named this church in this one-room schoolhouse, named it Greenwood Christian Church, 1860. GCC stayed in that one-room schoolhouse for seven years, and then they had to move to a bigger facility due to the rapid growth. And now they were located on the corner of Pearl and Smart Streets. And that larger facility served the congregation for about 34 years, but again, they had to move due to increased attendance. And in 1901, the church moved to Broadway and continued to grow rapidly. By the way, if you go into the office entrance of our building, you can see this glassed-in area, and some of the items in that Glaston area are from that 1901 version of Greenwood Christian Church. And so, if you notice, uh, there are chairs and there's tables in there that you can see, and that's some of our heritage, some of our, some of our history as a church. Again, they had to relocate to accommodate growth, and uh, this time we moved to 512 Madison Avenue. Some of you remember that location. How many of us in this room uh, were here when the 512 Madison Avenue location was, was around? Raise your hands up really high so we can look around. Yeah, some of the long timers, and we're glad, we're glad that you guys are with us now. Um, we stayed at that location at 512 Madison until the year 2000 when we moved to this location. The point is that, that God took that mere $200 and did something miraculous. Thousands of people have been introduced to Christ and have been fed the bread of life thanks to that small offering of $200. I know with inflation, $200 in 1860 is more like $6,000 in today's currency, but that's still a small price to pay when you think about the countless souls that have been touched because of that small donation, because a few people had faith and an outward focus, and they were willing to use what they had to impact 
the world. I don't know about you, but sometimes I wonder, what, what can I do? You know, like, what, what do I have to offer? You know, like, I, I mean, how, how much can I really accomplish by myself? And I'm here to tell you that the answer to that question is a resounding nothing. We cannot do anything on our own. When it comes to my offering, yeah, I practice percentage giving, as many of you do too, but I just wonder, what can, what can my small amount really accomplish in the long run? Can I really make that much of a difference by myself? Me alone, I can only do so much, but with the help of God, I can do more than I could have ever imagined. And that is our main point today. If you're taking notes, you can write this down, or if you're on the app, there's a place where you can take notes there, and you can follow along uh, with the Scripture as well on the app. Uh, But write this down. Little becomes much in the Messiah's hand. If you feel like you don't have much to give, then you're in a perfect place to find a miracle because God wants to work through those with an outward focus, those who are are willing to give their best and watch God bless the rest. Check out in your Bibles uh, John chapter 6 verses 1 through 15. John is in the New Testament. It's one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Many of us in this room believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that He was fully God and fully man. I've heard preachers say that Jesus was God in a bod, and I like that. But the truth is that hindsight is 2020, isn't it? The, that realization took the disciples a while to figure out. You know, they, they were seeing Jesus' miracles and, and saw him attract huge crowds, and they just knew that they were in good with their rabbi. They didn't know that the prophecy of the Messiah was being revealed before their very eyes, and the future of the church would soon be established. These guys were about to see something unimaginable happen in their presence. Their faith in the Messiah was about to grow a little bit stronger as they saw Jesus do the impossible. And our faith can grow, too, by reading this passage. Uh, We can learn about uh, what what faith requires by reading this story, by by seeing this experience, and, and we can back up those claims by looking at examples in the Old Testament as we slip into the mindset of an Old Testament Jew and what he or she may have thought when they saw Jesus feed the multitude. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. By the way, this this experience, this miracle, is the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels, uh, except for the resurrection the feeding of the multitude, and the resurrection. And this shows the significance of this specific miracle. As these disciples realized that little becomes much in the Messiah's hands. So John chapter 6, verse 1, it says this, Sometime after this, it makes me pause and think, okay, well, what is this? That, Jesus, that, that, that John is writing about. Sometime after this, well, Jesus is gaining popularity. He's preaching. He's healing, sometimes on the Sabbath. He's claiming to be the Son of God, and the religious leaders don't like it. And so, after this, after all of this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is the Sea of Tiberias, And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near, 
And as we slip into a Jewish mindset, we have to recognize that these guys didn't yet know that Jesus would soon become their, their Passover lamb, the Messiah who takes away the sins of the world. Verse 5 goes on, then when Jesus looked up, he saw a great crowd coming towards him, and he said to Philip, uh, hey, Philip, where shall we buy bread for all of these people to eat? Now, he asked him this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. I love that. Verse 7 says that Philip answered him, uh, uh, Jesus, hold on. It would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to even have a bite. You see, Philip was looking at the reasons that it couldn't happen rather than the one who could make it happen. Sounds like something we do, doesn't it? I can't do this. It's, it's too hard for me. I can't I can't save this marriage. It's too hard. I can't get out of debt. It's too deep. I can't do this. But I know the one who can. And that, that is faith. So how can I have that kind of faith? Well, first, faith requires a first step. I hope you've seen Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. If you haven't seen it, go watch that movie. It's a good one. Indiana Jones is on a journey to find the Holy Grail, and his next step is a step of faith, and he walks out onto an invisible bridge, and the only way for the bridge to appear is to step out into the unknown, into the void, And although it's scary, he has to take that first step. And that's what this small boy did in John chapter 6, verses 8 through 11. It says another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and said, "Here's here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will that go among so many? See, Andrew points out, a boy's small lunch. But we have to understand the significance of this lunch. Barley, as Melissa prayed about, barley is some of the cheapest of grain. So, barley loaves show that the boy didn't have much money. And two small fish indicate that it was just a little bit of meat, like sardines, maybe. The poor boy barely had enough for himself but he was willing to give what he had to Jesus. He was willing to make that first step of faith into the unknown. And Jesus could have done the miracle, right, without uh, the boy's help, but faith requires a first step. Not a miracle, but a faith requires a first step. So the boy and his small gift played an important part in making a huge impact. It also makes me realize that that age is not a factor in being used by God. We see older people, seniors, uh, being instruments of bringing, uh, bringing Isaac into the world. We see God use a young girl named Mary bring Jesus into the world. And this young boy was willing to give 100% of himself to the Lord's will. And regardless of your age, God can use you too. So verse 10 goes on, Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they all sat down, about 5,000 men were there. 5,000 men. Now if we factor also in the women and the children, then it very easily could have been ten to 20,000 people. And Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. 
man, what, what a sight this must have been. Can you imagine what the boy was thinking? Can you imagine what the disciples were thinking? To see Jesus give thanks for the boy's lunch and to see them begin to distribute it to the, to the groups of people and to see the people have as much as they wanted and to see the amazement on the disciples' faces, not to mention the boy's face, but the boy had to first hand over the lunch, and God came through, and you can see God come through for you, too. You just have to take that first step, that step into the unknown, to give of yourself for the spiritual wealth of another, to give the best of your gifts, talents, and energy, and watch God bless the rest. Even though it may feel like barley loaves at time and, and, and sardines that you have to give, you know, it becomes a spiritual feast when it's touched by the Messiah's hands. So faith requires a first step. And secondly, faith requires nothing be wasted. Write that down if you're taking notes. Faith requires nothing be wasted. Growing up, my parents would take me to Captain D's restaurant, and the food there was amazing. I mean, shrimp, gumbo, pecan pie, man, the, the best thing there was the hush puppies. Anymore, it's not my favorite, so, so don't go get me a, a Captain D's gift card because it's not, it doesn't agree with me anymore. Let's just leave it at that. And, uh, but as a kid, man, I loved it. I loved it. It was one of my favorite places. When I, was, when I was young, Captain D's had a special on their menu that if you finished your plate, then you'd get a prize. And it was just a sticker or a pencil or, you know, something small like that. But being the goal-oriented person that I am, I always wanted to finish my plate so that I could get the prize, right? Nothing was wasted, and in John chapter 6, verse 11 uh, through 13, the boy took the step of faith and made his resources available to God. He offered everything he had to Jesus, five barley loaves and two small fish, and God blessed his gift abundantly. And then verse 11 says, Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks, distributed it to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Man, 12 baskets left over from five small barley loaves. Why were there 12 baskets? Why that number? Maybe it was so that each of the 12 disciples could carry a basket back to Capernaum. Maybe it was to, to emphasize the ample sufficiency that Jesus provided. Who knows? But the lesson, the lesson that this teaches us is that we can know that Jesus will abundantly supply all of our needs when we, when we give what we have to help others. When we, when we leave nothing behind, because little becomes much in the Messiah's hands. You know, we don't all have the same resources. Some of us have more discretionary time than other people, right? We don't all have the same kind or amount of talent. We don't all have the same skills. We don't all have the same income or, you know, we don't all have the same expenses, so we won't all be able to serve, lead, or give in the same ways or to the same extent. But again, little becomes much in the Messiah's hands. So what can you do? How can you serve? What can you give? When you offer what you have to God, you invite 
him to do more than you could do by yourself. And when we as a church do that together, and it's been like this for, for years as a church, when we all do that together, God meshes our lives together to do amazing things, things that we could not do on our own. I think this experience gave these Jewish people flashbacks to Moses' life. Now, let's slip into the mindset of a Jewish person. Moses was a prophet, a, a spokesperson for God. When the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness, they became hungry, and they started to question Moses, and th- quite honestly, they just complained to him. And Exodus chapter 16, verse 3, shows us what they said to Moses. They said, Moses, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there at least we sat around with pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. And so God provided quail and bread in the desert. The Lord said to Moses, I've heard the Israelites grumbling. So tell them tonight, God will provide you with meat, and in the morning, He will provide you with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And so then in verse 13, it says, that evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it's the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. And they called it manna, which means, what is it? It's believed that Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, and it's important for us to understand that that he wrote, Moses wrote, Deuteronomy 18, 15, because it's likely that the people in Jesus' days, these Jewish men and women, were thinking about this passage in Deuteronomy 18. Moses wrote, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. So now, fast forward past Moses, 2,000 years later, and in John chapter 6, verses 14 through 15, Jesus performs the miracle of the feeding of the thousands of people with the boy's lunch, and the, the people think that Jesus is that prophet that Moses spoke about so long ago. It says this in 14, after the people saw the sign that Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely, this is the prophet who has come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Jesus didn't want to be known as a prophet because he's, he's so much more than that. Jesus is the Messiah, the bread of life, the one who has come into the world to take away the sins of the world. And listen to me, Jesus is reaching out his nail-scarred hands to you, telling you to join alongside of what he is doing in the world. So, My question for you is is simple. Will you take that first step? Will you give all you have? I'm telling you, it's worth it. It's worth it because little becomes much in the Messiah's hands. If you're ready to take that first step of faith, or maybe you just need 
prayer, you need to talk to someone about what's going on in your life, then um, I would encourage you to text the word next. You can even do that now on your phones. Text the word next, N-E-X-T, to the number 317-707-9997. Or you can go to the back of the room here and and there will be a person on staff or an elder waiting for you to talk to you and pray with you about what's going on in your life. I would just encourage you to take that that next step of, of, of faith because that small decision that you make, the small decision could change your life because little becomes much in the Messiah's hands. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful uh, for the opportunity to gather here together. And God, sometimes what we have to give feels so small compared to what you gave us, God, through Jesus, the sacrifice that he made for us. But God, I pray that we would not see our gifts as, as small. Help us, to, help us to see our gifts as joining alongside of what you're doing in this world to make a difference in this world. God, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to, to join alongside of, of you. And Father, I pray that each one of us would do that and that you would mesh us together somehow miraculously to make a huge difference in the world because of Jesus and what he's done for us. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. As we move into a time of communion, you know, there's really no place that we see the principle of the five loaves and the two fish played out more than when Jesus was on the cross. Jesus gave everything to the Father. And God accepted his perfect holy sacrifice and made a way to forgive the sins of humanity, past, present, and future. It's an amazing gift. It's an amazing celebration that we we do when when we go and we take the bread in the bottom cup and remember that it represents Christ's body. And then we drink the juice in the top cup and It reminds us of the blood that he shed for us that covers our sin. So during this next song, we encourage you, if you're in this room, to locate the closest station to you and celebrate communion with us as we sing. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation, Jesus. There is a light that overwhelms the dark.
Messiah, my Savior, there is power in your name. You're my rock and my redeemer, there is power in your name, in your name. You walk on the water, you speak to the sea, you stand inside me Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We're glad you were here. Go out this week and put everything in Jesus' hands. God bless. We love you.